Uh, before we begin, I would like to share a little bit of information about Wild Ones LLC. Uh, we are a national nonprofit that was founded in the 1970s, and it's, uh, currently it has about 100 chapters in 29 states. Our mission is focused on promoting environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and the establishment of native plant communities. Uh, if you want to learn more about Wild Ones, you could visit wildones.org. And um, while you're there, you could visit um, the uh, templates that they have to build your native garden. And right now, New Jersey has uh, two designs that you could um, obtain from there and would give you the plants, native plants from the region. On a local level, uh, Wild Ones New Jersey Gateway, we serve six counties in New Jersey, and that is uh, Hudson, Sussex, Union, Bergen, Essex, Middlesex, and um, Passaic. Uh, so if you are from one of those counties, uh, reach out to us. We would love to talk plants with you, garden plants, that's our thing. Um, our chapter's goal is to develop and support you and your community through educational opportunities such as this webinar tonight. We also have newsletters and we're working on a demonstration garden for you to come and visit. Um, we also plan to have plant sales in the future, field trips and hikes. If you liked something that you heard, please do come support us, join us, um, be part of the uh, family, like I said before. This year, we're working closely with a few schools to assist them in the design and the support component of building and maintaining a pollinator garden, which I like to always call an outdoor learning space. Uh, if you know of a school looking for such help, please let us know. We would love to partner with them. Um, with your support, we can make a difference in um, the quality and the health of not only the flora, but the fauna as well. And now let me share with you some highlights on our very accomplished presenter, Deb Ellis, which we're very grateful that she's here today. Um, she is known as an environmental activist. And I know that because I, I attended the steward, um, her steward, um, Rutgers steward environmental um, program with her. And yeah, she is an activist, all right. Um, so Deb is um, not only an activist, she's a community builder and educator. She is very passionate about teaching our community how to use native plants to promote bio biodiversity and to heal the earth. She is the founder and leader of the Essex chapter of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, a master gardener, Rutgers environmental steward, and formerly served an, on the Montclair Environmental Commission. She is a retired social justice lawyer who was named Champion of Change in 2011 by the Obama White House. Deb's love for nature and gardening developed at an early age. She thanks her father, Homer, who planted wildflowers with her when she was a girl, and her mom, Lois Mary, who made beautiful bouquets from such precious flowers. As an adult, she grew her home garden while raising two kids, which is an accomplishment that I have to say, and commuting from New Jersey to New York. So she became an expert at keep it simple gardening with natives. And because of her love, compassion, and knowledge, she is here tonight to guide us as we learn simple things we can do to help our native birds. Thank you, Deb. Thank, thank you so much. That was a wonderful mm -hmm. um, introduction. I am going to share my screen here. Okay. So um, Gisela told, told you about my um, qualifications. So one thing I should say is I'm not a scientist. A lot of people who give talks like this are actually scientists. I'm an amateur gardener, um, and I think all of us amateur gardeners learn by doing. So I hope I can give you the benefit of my experience and uh, um, 
and, and the mistakes, the things I've learned from making mistakes, which is a great way to learn. So here's what I hope to do tonight. I'm gonna to talk about the four things that birds need. Um, their water, nesting sites and cover, which I'm really gonna talk about together, and food. So um, I'm really going to spend most of the time on food, which is why uh, that's the biggest. Um, but some of our native plants can also provide cover and nesting sites too. So um, we'll focus on plants that provide cover and produce seeds, nectar, berries, and caterpillars. One thing I want you to go away with um, is the importance of host plants in making caterpillars, which are which are baby food for almost all birds. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So I, I'm not gonna dwell on the decline of birds, but one reason that all of us who work on these issues, like Haley and Gisela and myself, and many of you who are watching, is because there's we're living in the midst of a biodiversity crisis. It's a huge, huge problem which does not get enough attention. There's actually been a, th um, a 3 billion decline of birds in North America in the last 50 years. Just imagine that, that's in the first um, bullet point here, right here, the 3 billion decline. Um, trying to make my little, okay, there's this 3 billion. So, and that includes our common birds, and it means that, and there's also 432 species that are at risk of extinction. Um, so one, I like this quote that birdsong is the soundtrack to an environmentally healthy garden. We want to, we want to have birds in our garden. And if we do have native gardens, we will have birds. There's no question about that. We may not all have the pileated woodpeckers if we live in urban areas, but we'll have birds. So these, so this again is, um, what the, the things the birds need. Um, and this slide is all I'm gonna say about water because water is what, I'm gonna have one more slide about. It. This is um, electric bird bath for the winter. So water is the easiest thing to provide. Um, here's the other pictures of it in the summer. Uh, the one thing I wanna say about it is that shallow is better than deep. So this is the upset, this is real. This is a pot I found, this pot here I found I picked a trash, picked it basically. Um, and then this is a clay pot from underneath a flower pot and it's very shallow, but I still have a little sloping rock there. You see how, so the birds can walk in it. And um, so you don't want something very deep. That's the main thing to watch for when you're looking for a bird bath. The an added plus is if you have moving water. So I did have a solar bird bath. That's the picture to the left. Um, I don't have it anymore. It's there, there. They were hard to sometimes clean, and but I think the solar bird baths are getting better. So it's a great idea. I think all solar products are getting better. So if you can find a way through electricity or solar to have moving water, that's an added plus for the birds. Not necessary, but a nice added plus. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about cover, which is another better word maybe is shelter or home. And a lot of times the cover or the shelter is also where they do raise their young. Of course, one thing you can do to help birds raise your young is to put in bird boxes. So we won't talk more about that, but that's something to consider. Why is cover important? Um, well, the bird's movement in a landscape is based on trying to avoid predators. So they don't like to cross open spaces. And so they like dense foliage. And if you can do it from you know, in native gardening, we often try to do layering. We have ground covers, then we have flowers and shrubs and trees. So the more we can have that layering, the more the birds will feel comfortable um, in our in our properties. Um, so this is just to show you that what different species of birds want varies. So some like tall canopy trees, um, you might see like, where I live, I don't see um, all of these, but I do see woodpeckers up on the tall canopy trees, especially the ones that are unfortunately not doing so well because the emerald ash borer provides good habitat for the, um, the woodpeckers. Um, the, in other places, you might see more of the raptors or the swallows or the swifts, but tall canopy trees are great. And then we want mid-story or understory trees like dogwoods, um, or service berry, and that is also a lot of birds like that. And then some um, birds um, 
like uh, our shrub nesters and like more open um, places. One example of that is bluebirds, which I've never put a bluebird box up because I know my garden is too small and not open enough. Um, so, you know, there are different requirements and this is just a basic summary, but just so to get an idea that having a diversity of layers is also helping a diversity of birds. So this is my little urban yard in Montclair, New Jersey, um, in Essex County. And you may think, well, I don't have that much space. So I just wanna show people that research shows that even small habitats make a big difference. If we can aim for 70%, including tree cover, that's, the, that's ideal. Um, and the National Wildlife Federation found that 51 insect species were present in their certified yards versus 14 in uncertified yards. Um, just want to make a note about that for somebody. Um, so the um, that's, and this shows just in my little yard here, you can see how small it is because this flag is not my property. That's my next door neighbors. So this, I have ground covers here, marsh marigold. Then I have winterberry bushes that we're going to hear about. I have um, non-native hydrangeas. So I do have some non-natives. I have a Mount Laurel back here. I have swamp milkweed that you can't see. Um, and over here I have a button bush. Um, so a lot of different things here, creating lots of layering, even though I don't have room to put a lot of big trees in. I have recently put an oak tree over here off the slide, but um, because I've been convinced by Doug Tallamy to, to do an oak tree. But anyway, it just shows you how you can cram a lot in and that's great for the birds. So I'm gonna talk about some ways that um, we can provide cover and, um, and, and also some of this provide seeds too. Um, grasses, native grasses are a great way and there's many native grasses, but I'm just gonna highlight two, which is switchgrass on the left and little blue stem. So the nice thing about grass is even though these are not evergreen, they'll provide structure all through the winter. So you can see on the left here how um, dense this is. Um, and so that is a nice, uh, maybe they're not gonna nest right there. This particular photo is in what we I call a hell strip, which is the space between a sidewalk and the street. So it's hellish growing conditions. Um, and maybe I we wouldn't think a bird would nest there, but they might nest in this kind of grass somewhere else. Um, this is uh, to the right here is little blue stem. And that is um, uh, growing in a schoolyard. It's also covering up the air conditioner there. And then you can see it in the winter to the right so that you can see how that provides structure. And grasses also provide uh, seeds. Um, so that's a nice thing for the birds too, if we can provide um, both cover because they're so dense and um, food with the same plant. Um, I'm most all my slides about plants are going to have growing conditions for you. I am not going to um, read them all, but you can summarize. You can look at it. I'll summarize them often. Uh, you can take a picture of it. So, and I'm glad to have um, I'm glad to have Wild Ones distribute a PDF um, if they would like to afterwards. Uh, so, switchgrass. I'll just say one thing about the growing. Most grasses do like sun. Uh, and the switchgrass is more flexible on moisture. The little blue stem grass really wants dry, a dry environment. So evergreens is another important idea to consider um, for wildlife shelter. Um, they're also just nice for us to look at. And so I think that's a nice thing because they can be a, a shelter all through the year. Um, and so they give protection from predators, and if you have room, of course, consider large, there's large evergreen trees. I've listed a few here, um, but I'm gonna assume that most of you are probably not looking for a tree to plant. Um, so I'm gonna focus on shrubs more and other plants throughout the seminar. So um, here's an example of two kinds of evergreen cover. And this is an interesting example from my colleague, um, Alice von Strahlen who works with me on the um, Essex chapter of Native Plant Society because she has done this work in her condo development. And that's a nice example of trying to incorporate natives no matter where you live. So there's two things I wanna point out here. One is a sedge. And uh, this is an evergreen sedge. It's called plantain leaf sedge or um, Carex 
you can see it over here. I'm not going to try to pronounce all the Latin names, but I do want to say the scientific names are very important. So the scientific names, as you may or may not know, is the first one is genus. The second one is species. Plants can have more than one common name. In fact, this plant has two common names. It's called seersucker sedge or plantain leaf sedge, but it only has one scientific name. All plants have only one scientific name. So when you go to look for these plants, please use a scientific name, much more precise. So the sedges are a great thing. And I've mentioned in my slide here, the Eisel nursery chart. So Haley, if you wanna just Google Eisel nursery and look for their sedge chart, um, you might wanna put that in the chat for people. It's a great chart of all the different sedges. Most of them are not evergreen. That's why I'm highlighting this one, but it's a great thing to consider in general. Um, Mount Cuba also did a big study on sedges this year. Then another idea for um, evergreen cover is um, golden ragwort, which is growing here. This is a spring blooming plant. Notice that I say six to 18 inches. Well, this is only six inches, right? But the 18 inches is uh, what it is when it's blooming, a beautiful yellow color. But of course, we don't want to cut away the leaves and the leaves stay evergreen all winter. You can trust me on this because I do a native ground covers talk. And for that, I've taken pictures of this in the snow and it's still evergreen in the snow. You know, all of us who care about native plants also do not want to plant invasives. And a lot of our invasive plants are either shrubs or vines. So it's also good to know about these evergreens because these are good replacements for like vinca vine or English ivy. Uh, the ferns are another nice category to consider for ground covers. And here's, most of them are not evergreen, but here are two that are. So this is my last um, evergreen recommendation. And they are, they all grow in the shade um, and they are all deer resistant. Although I was at a training this weekend in Stokes and one person told me that she's seen the deer even trying to eat some of the ferns. So, you know, the deer don't read the books always. So um, generally they're deer resistant. I love the ferns because they're an ancient family of plants that they were eaten by dinosaurs. And this is a, be a beautiful picture, I think, of ferns in Kitsitini Forest showing how they're a nice ground cover. And you can just see how they would be, um, you know, good cover here under the leaves and just nice place for birds to hide. So here's um, the two in a little close-up of each of one. The marginal wood fern is on the left. As the winter goes on, that has a more um, upright habit. The Christmas fern, which is so-called because the settlers used it as to decorate their homes, um, it's more uh, cascading, um, but they both stay green all through. You can see I put the dates there so you can see that they're still staying green all winter. So that's especially nice to consider. Now we're going to talk about um, food, and that's actually the thing that we're going to spend most of our time on. Um, and here's some of the things um, that the different birds eat. So there are some are, and many of them are flexible. There are they eat more than one. So insectivores are um, plants, uh, birds that eat insects. And I want to highlight that they're all 97% of land birds are um, eat caterpillars to or feed their their babies caterpillars. Um, the nectar eatings are hum, are hummingbirds and orioles, and we'll do a, a special little section on hummingbirds because, like Pamela, I love hummingbirds. We all do. Um, then there's the fruit eaters, and many of them are fruit eaters in the fall and the winter when the berries are out. And then there's omnivores like the blue jays and carnivores. Well, I'm not going to um, talk about that those. Um, so, um, 97% of land birds feed caterpillars to their young because, um, caterpillars are really high sources of protein. There's someone who's not muted. I'm hearing some noise. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Whoever took care of that. And they need an amazing amount of caterpillars. Of course, they're tiny. So one, Doug, Professor Doug Tallamy, who's done a lot of work and research in native plants, um, has um, estimated that songbirds like the black-capped chickadee need 6,000 plus caterpillars for one nest, which is incredible. Which means that we want to plant plants that the caterpillars, um, that the butterflies and moths will lay their eggs on so that they'll have caterpillars, right? That's really an important thing to do. Why are caterpillars excellent bird food? Well, 
just think that they're pretty large compared to other insects. You can see my little math there, 200 aphids equal one caterpillar. They're very edible um, and they're very nutritious. I call them the Gerber baby food of the bird world. They're high in protein and fats and antioxidants and carotenoids. Um, so they're the perfect baby food. So we want to encourage, um, we want to encourage uh, or want to plant plants where the caterpillars will um, be there. So I think the one thing I said I want to make sure you all go away with is this concept of host plants. And I'm sure many of you know it, but a host plant is a plant where a butterfly or moth will lay their egg. And the thing is, is that many of our plants, um, many of our butterflies and moths, sorry, are specialized to lay their eggs on only one or a few host plants. And kind of the most well-known example is um, milkweed, that monarch will only lay their eggs on milkweed. So if we don't have milkweed, we won't have monarchs. Um, but it's also true for many other, many butterflies and moths are, are fairly specialized. And so here's an example from, for New Jersey, our state flower is the violet. And on the right is a fritillary butterfly. And the violet is one of the host plants for the fritillary butterfly. So I just wanted to share this chart um, from Doug Tallamy's work to show you what are some of the highest, um, what we call the keystone plants that support the most butterflies and moths and therefore have the most caterpillars. So the oak tree um, supports over 534 species of um, butterflies and moths lay their eggs on the oak tree. So if you have the space, plant an oak tree because then you will have the most caterpillars and that will be great bird food. Um, another thing you might learn from tonight is what is frass? Frass rhymes with grass, but it is caterpillar poop. And there was one time when I was hiking and I learned about this from a friend of mine when we were hiking out in Stokes Forest where there's a lot of trees and so a lot of um, oak trees and a lot of caterpillars and therefore a lot of caterpillar poop. And it actually sounded like a soft rain. And then I hiked in the same area with my son a few days later and there was so much frass, it was actually falling on us as we ate our lunch. It was quite charming actually. And he'll always remember, he always remembers he's 30 that I, um, that I talked about frass. So. Um, so now you've learned about frass too. These are some of the keystone, these are the keystone perennials, the top ones for our area, the goldenrod, the asters, the sunflowers, and some others. So again, um, by planting flowers, if you don't have room for an oak tree, you can also encourage more caterpillars and more um, baby food. So we're going to talk about some of those flowers in a few minutes. Um, Seed plants are also important. Um, and many of the flowers that we plant that I'm gonna talk about also produce seeds. Um, the seeds are high in fat and protein. You can see our state bird that I said was my favorite on the top there, the goldfinch eating the seeds of a cone flower. So I have chosen plants that are host plants when I'm gonna focus on them. So one simple way to provide seeds um, is to leave the stem. So when you're doing a fall cleanup, um, don't do a very good fall cleanup. And we'll talk about that in more detail later on. But I want to just mention the context of seeds right now, because look at the purple coneflower on the left. That's left up, it's beautiful. Um, and it also has seeds in it for birds. I have seen goldfinches on my, cone, um, my coneflower heads in the middle of the winter. In fact, the first time I gave a version of this talk, which was maybe four years ago to the Master Gardeners, I came home and saw a goldfinch in my backyard um, on a coneflower head. So that was really cool. And I've listed here some of the especially important flowers right here, um, which are also happens to be a lot of them that are um, host plants, um, the asters, the golden rose, and sunflowers particularly, but Joe Pye too. So these, if you can't leave them all up, leave, leave up these. And then just to prove my point, here's a wonderful photo by my colleague, Becky LeBoy um, of our, our Jersey Coast chapter for the Native Plant Society. And that goldfinch is eating the seeds of something called summer sweet. It's also called sweet pepper bush. And you can see how the seeds there look like little peppercorns, right? And I can't believe she caught a picture of the um, goldfinch in the winter. That's why it's not so bright yellow eating it. 
So um, now I want to talk about some of the um, those flowers that we can plant that will both provide seeds and our host plants for caterpillars so provide baby food too. Um, the or just or just insects for them to eat also because it attracts so many insects. So um, one is goldenrod, and there's many types of goldenrod. Um, and my favorite is and the most flexible is wreath goldenrod. Wreath goldenrod grows in the sun or the shade. Um, some goldenrods can be a little aggressive. This is what we call well behaved. It doesn't um, move. Or, it, it doesn't spread so quickly. All the goldenrods are deer resistant. Um, and their seeds, you can see this, I've listed here, the seeds are favored by, are favored by um, several different species of birds too. Um, so that's a nice thing to um, do, to, 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 uh, to try. I, I say that wreath goldenrod takes the gold due to its elegance and wide adaptability. It's called wreath goldenrod because it was um, twined in, it can be twined into stems. It has that nice kind of over, arch, an arching habit. And again, that's one with two common names. It's also called blue stem. So important to have a scientific name. So, um, okay. So one thing you may be thinking, well, I'm not planting goldenrod, even though it is the best host plant because it causes allergies, but actually it doesn't. Um, and I can be definitive about this. You see this little two spotted bumblebee here, the Pollen in goldenrod is very sticky. So it is not windblown, which was what would make you sneeze if it was blown by the wind. Instead, it's carried around by hardworking, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way, by hardworking little bees. Um, I like the, the video so much, I'm playing it twice. Um, and they transfer the pollen. So it's What's making you sneeze? If it's the same, if you're sneezing around now, it's probably ragweed, which blooms about the same time, but is wind pollinated. So have no fear, you can plant goldenrod. So another, um, oh, I just realized I made a mistake here. <laughs> the uh, New England aster, here's my mistake. This is a coneflower photo. So this is not the photo of, um, this is not the seed head of the aster. That's the seed head of coneflower, which will be in a later slide. So sorry about that. That produces great seeds. Asters is another great um, uh, host plant, and New England aster um, is uh, a good a good type of aster to plant. It um, it is not good for um, shade. So white wood aster is a good choice for shade. It needs sun, but it's very flexible otherwise, and it's. Um, it also uh, has great seeds for chickadees and goldfinches, especially. Um, I mentioned the goldenrods are deer resistant. The aster, the New England aster is not deer resistant. I think the white wood aster is because I see it so much in the wild. Um, but for both the goldenrods and the asters, um, my little garden tip is to cut them in half in June. It has a fancy word called Chelsea chop because it can also be done in May, which is at the time of the England Chelsea Flower Show. But I do it in mid-June and it makes them shorter so they're not, not so floppy. Um, but I do find that I have deer in my urban neighborhood and the deer do the Chelsea chop on me for the New England aster. And they um, and it still blooms. So they, they cut it down, they eat it, but they don't usually cut it down enough um, that it doesn't bloom. So that's... Um, a way to live with the deer. Let them do the Chelsea chop for you. This is just a fun fact I like to share. All the asters, no matter what species, have yellow centers and red centers. Why the difference? I call it the aster stoplight. Um, it's because as the bees are taking the pollen, the um, center turns redder and redder. So there it's yellow, the bees on the yellow one, there's a little yellow left and there it's very dark red. So look for that when you're looking at any aster, it's a really cool thing. Aren't native plants magical? I think so. And there's asters and goldenrod in my yard. So another flower I wanna talk about is the um, woodland sunflower or the, the species Helianthus, which was the third keystone species. So it also produces a lot of caterpillars for birds. Um, and the, um, 
and it also produces seeds. So you can see there's another great picture by Becky Lavoie, this time of a goldfinch that still has its colors in the summer, actually eating the seeds of a woodland sunflower while it is blooming still too. So these, um, this species, the Helianthus um, genus, generally um, get to be very tall. They have a long bloom time and they're generally not very deer resistant. Um, one species, swamp sunflower, is a little more deer resistant. So that's something um, that you might want to consider though. I love them because of the long bloom time and because there's not that many bright yellow flowers that will bloom in this shade. And you can see that this will gr grow in sun or part shade and including dry shade. Um, and that's a wonderful thing to have, um, especially late in the summer. So, and as I had said earlier, the goldfinch is my favorite bird and it's our state bird too. So now I wanna talk um, about a few flowers for hummingbirds because hummingbirds are a, kind of a special situation and that they're not eating seeds, they're not eating berries, they're looking for um, nectar generally but they also do need small insects for protein, especially for their young. Remember, they all want those small insects. The caterpillars might be a little too big for the hummingbirds. So hummingbirds prefer brightly colored tubular flowers. Um, their favorite is red, although I think they like other thing, other colors too. So I'm gonna talk um, briefly about columbine, trumpet, honeysuckle, bee balm, and cardinal flower. So, Columbine is a spring blooming flower. Um, it's very flexible about the sun requirements. It can be full sun to shade, so that's really nice. I think it's a gorgeous form. I have a close up of it here. Very flexible on, seed, on its um, soil. And um, it's nectar for butterflies and for hummingbirds. I have to say that I've never seen a hummingbird on my columbine, to be honest. I like to tell people my experience, and I have quite a bit of it. But I have been told over and over and read that the columbine generally um, blossoms in line with the hummingbird's migration northward. So maybe you will be luckier than me and see it, um, see a hummingbird on your columbine. And in my experience, the hummingbirds in my neighborhood usually come a little later than what this blooms. So this is another one with red tubular flowers, trumpet honeysuckle, truly a gorgeous native honeysuckle. And this also blooms in the spring, although a little bit later than columbine. And then it, it has, I use the word pulses, which is kind of a funny word, but it keeps blooming even until December. So the picture I have is when it was blooming, you know, it's full flush of bloom, um, but it is still blooming a little bit. Um, very flexible on light. Um, it's a woody vine that's easy to control. You could also use it as a ground cover. Um, it's a host plant in addition to being a hummingbird, plant, a hummingbird plant. And it does have little berries here. So I wanna just highlight, I took this picture a few weeks ago to show the berries. I don't know if those berries um, turn a color because my birds are eating them too fast. So I have only seen them as green and then they're gone already. So the next one is um, two species of the genus Monarda, Monarda didyma and wild bergamot. Um, so bee balm and wild bergamot, they're very, they're related. This picture is the um, bee balm and it's the red one. The wild bergamot is purple, um, but they're both native flowers and they can be susceptible to powdery mildew, um, but it doesn't really hurt the plant. So I just leave that alone. Um, it's a great um, flower to consider, and you can see here's a picture of a hummingbird on it. It blooms a little bit later than those other two, so I'm going by the progression of bloom and how I'm um, organizing these. And then my last hummingbird flower is actually, to me, the best one, the hummingbird, what I call the hummingbird magnet, which is the cardinal flower. And that blooms in August and September. It's still blooming a little bit now, so into October. Um, it prefers moisture and part shade, but I've grown it in full sun. I've grown it in dry conditions because I just love this plant. And I have to say, I've seen less butterflies this season, which makes me sad, and less hummingbirds. But I did see a hummingbird on this a couple of weeks ago, so I was really happy because normally we see quite a few. Uh, it has some deer resistance. I've been noting the deer resistance on the slides, but not always saying it. Um, the deer actually did chomp at my cardinal flowers this year. The first time I've really noticed that 
as I said, they don't always read the, the deer resistance charts, but the, the cardinal flowers just revived and kept blooming. So they're really looking beautiful now, even though they were chopped. So I guess they just prune them. Okay, so now we're gonna do um, berry plants. Um, and here, and, I, and I'm gonna try to organize it by season. I think I'm just gonna stop for a second though and just check, do a quick check-in with everyone and just see if uh, people have any questions. Maybe we take one or two questions if there's something pressing or if there's none, that's fine. Hi, awesome, that's great. Um, I will ask a question um, that I thought was pretty interesting and maybe you have some insight on um, that one of our guests asks. Um, what can you tell us um, about native cultivars effect on the birds? Um, if you can explain also what a cultivar is, that would be super helpful. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. I'm glad that was asked and then I can talk about it now because there's cult I'm gonna talk about bushes and there's cultivars of bushes. So cultivar means literally cultivated variety. So the C-U-L from cultivated and then variety, V-A-R, cultivar, you put it together. And it is um, after the, the genus and the species, there would be another word. So an example is purple coneflower, um, uh, purple, no, New England aster purple dome. It's a, um, cultivar that is more sh shorter and more compact than the straight species. We call it when it's just two words, the straight species. And the um, at the Native Plant Society, we generally recommend the straight species because we believe it has the most ecological benefit. We particularly do not like cultivars that change the leaf or the flower color because then we're afraid the insects and birds cannot find it. So if it's a cultivar that just changes the size, which a lot of them are those, then it seems to be more acceptable. And in fact, I do have a fair number of bushes that are cultivars that are just smaller versions. They don't look any different except they're smaller. I have a small property and I try to squish in as many plants as I can. So yeah, that's a totally great question to sense. address right now. Yeah, it makes sense. So, you know, it's it would be great to know what your native option is so that when you find a cultivar, you're aware of what has been changed with it so that you can make a, you know, conscious decision of like, if it is a little shorter, then maybe it's not a big deal. But if it's like a whole other color, maybe that animal, that bird, that insect can't detect it anymore. It's not familiar to them. So they don't go to it, um, you know, evolutionarily. Exactly. Another thing that's notable is some cultivars don't really are not as hardy as our native plants. One thing that's great is our native plants are very hardy. So some years ago, before I learned this, I thought, oh, I like home flowers. Maybe I'll buy uh, some white ones. So I bought a white one and then it died in a couple of years, you know, so that took care of itself. My, <laughs> I took care of my ignorance by dying. Um, and uh, cauliflowers is a good example that there's some really crazy hybrids that have like double blooms. You do not want to get those. The, the more it doesn't look like the original, the less valuable ecologically it is. So yeah, should I do one more question or that was a great one to do right now? Absolutely. Um, if you want to do another question, I can definitely ask one, maybe an, an easy, like simple, simple one. Um, what is the difference between nectar and pollen? You were talking about it a little bit earlier with the hummingbird. Um, if you could explain that a little further. Right. Well, the nectar is like the honey that they're sucking out. Um, and the pollen is what's used to fertilize one plant for um, to another. So when the bees are eating, they're, they are pollen is getting on their bodies and going to, and that's how they're fertilizing for the plants. So they're getting the reward of the nectar, but then they're taking the pollen from one plant to another. The, the, um, the, the cardinal flower is actually pollinated by the hummingbirds. So they're picking up, I guess, pollen from the cardinal flower and transferring it when they're, um, are taking the nectar. So, okay. Awesome. That sounds great. Thank you so much for explaining that and for taking the moment. And as a reminder, please feel free to send your questions in the Q&A or in the chat. And you're welcome to use reactions and please, you know, feel free to interact. We, we love hearing from you guys and how you're enjoying the webinar. All right, let's get back. Great. Into it. We'll get back into it. And
Great. Um, I think this is right. Yeah, I hope. I, oh, I know. I want to just do one thing here. Uh, that did not work. Okay. So um, these are a summary of some of the um, the bushes we're going to talk about uh, by season, thinking about how the birds will use them. Um, the one thing I want to point out is the last line of the slide here is I didn't have much space for bushes. So I took out a whole privet hedge and privet I, is a not native plant. I think it's even invasive. And it then gave me a space to put in native bushes, which are actually easier to care for than the privet hedge, which I had to hire someone um, in order to trim it. And all these native bushes I'm gonna talk about, I barely ever prune them. So, um, so let's on to the bushes then. So the very earliest one to ripen is um, a bush with three names. And I like all the names, shad bush, service berry, June berry. Um, the shad, it blooms very early. You can see it blooming down here. It blooms in April to May. And um, it, so it's, it blooms when the shad are running, which is why it's called shad bush. It blooms when near Easter services, when in the Appalachians, when the minister could get through after the snow melted to perform weddings and funerals is the story I've heard. And it's called June berry because it um, has these beautiful berries in June for the birds. So it's the first berry um, to be available to birds. Um, all these um, bushes are basically tolerant of part shade because in nature, they're understory bushes in the woods. Um, but they will probably produce more berries in the um, in the in the sun, the more sun you can give them. But they will be um, fine to be in part shade. And this one is edible to us. Um, and it actually tastes really good, which is not so true of all of them that are edible to us. So here is another one, our state bush, the blueberry, um, which uh, blooms. Um, it has little blooms. The blooms are very inconspicuous, but it um, the berries come in like June, July. Um, it's a great plant for wildlife. You can see how I've highlighted that here in bold, that it has, uh, it has nectar, it has berries, and it's a host plant too. Um, I've listed a specialty grower here, over here on the left, um, that specializes just in blueberries. And they say for the best fruit set to plant two or three species, but you have to ones that bloom at the same time so that they can be fertilized. I don't think I'd worry about that too much. I think having just any kind of blueberry is, um, is helpful. Uh, on the blueberries, I have to say, I never get to eat any of them because the birds eat them before I get to them, um, which is fine. You could put bird netting over it to keep the birds out, but this is all about feeding the birds. So it's good that they like them. The next one um, I'm going to focus on is arrowwood um, and the scientific name is viburnum. They, this is one where the scientific name is often used. I do wanna say that some viburnums are not um, native, like for example, Korean viburnum. Um, when I started doing gardening, I bought Korean viburnum because I thought, oh, viburnums are good. This one is called spice bush is another name for spicy, is a spicy smell, Korean spice viburnum. It's not spice bush. That was a mistake when I said that. Um, but then I realized, wait a minute, it's not a native. And I actually took it out, even though it smelled good. So that's to show you how it's always native gardening or any gardening, but especially native gardening, it's always a process of learning, right? Um, and this has great fruit. In pictures about arrowwood, um, there's always shows this purple fruit. But I tell you, I have it's always seen the birds eating the fruit when it's green. So basically the fruit is gone by July and I've never seen the purple fruit. Um, I used to think it wasn't even fruiting, but then I just watched more closely and saw that the birds are eating it. They're just eating it. Um, they're just eating it earlier. So it has beautiful blossoms. I just looked at the time. So I see I should start going a little faster. This is a clear wing um, moth that um, is on the underside of a viburnum leaf that Mayor um, McClellan at Gino's Nursery caught this picture last week. Isn't that cool? 
So another one is summer sweet, another bush. Um, and this does not produce berries. I'm mostly focusing on bushes that produce berries, but I want to um, just kind of, again, highlight that all of these things produce seeds um, and insects, which are also important for birds. And that, cause this, um, the, right here, we'll see, this is the picture of the bird eating the seeds of this. Cause it's also, in addition to summer sweet, it's also called sweet pepper bush. That's another, and that's the seeds that are going to be there after it blooms. And again, this is a picture in the fall when the goldfinch has lost its color. This is probably my number one favorite bush for birds and just to grow of a native bush because, and of course I only grow natives. Um, it has a beautiful, beautiful fall color, which I um, had the presence of mine in early in a busy April when I'm doing so many native plant things to actually stop for a minute and take this gorgeous picture in my driveway. You can see what a narrow, maybe you can see what a narrow space is growing in here. It's just this little strip of land. This is driveway. This is another house. Um, and then it has these beautiful berries. Um, and these are edible for us too, but they are called chokeberry for a reason. They're not as tasty as uh, service berries or blueberries, um, but the birds like them. Um, the I had a lot of berries a couple of weeks ago and they're all gone. So thinking about the sequence of berries, um, now this is like early fall and that's, and these are, you know, pretty much all digested by the birds and I've seen chipmunks eating them too. The next one is inkberry holly. And this is, um, has birds that the, the berries are coming now, but they're going to, they're going to stay there longer. They're going to stay there through the winter. And there's two schools of thought about why some berries persist and the birds don't eat them right away. Like they do eat the um, chokeberries right away. And some people think, well, maybe they just don't taste as good and that birds have to be really hungry before they're going to eat them. Or other people say, well, the berries get more um, palatable, more tasty as the season goes on. So I don't think we really know the answer to that. This is notable because in addition to berries, it also has is evergreen, so it provides cover too. So it's a really nice replacement for the non-native boxwood bushes. Um, and it's also, I wanna point out, it's a dioecious. So it's a fancy word that means that you need a male and female plant in order to produce berries. But a male can have a harem. So you can have one male plant and several females to produce the berries. You don't need one for one. Another dioecious plant is the um, winterberry holly. Um, there's many hollies. There's hollies that are that do keep their leaves. The big holly tree. There is a um, some of those are not native, but there is a native version. Um, but all of the hollies um, need uh, male and female. That's the inkberry holly was the holly family too. They're all the genus here. Uh, ilex right here. Ilex. So. This is um, not notable because it can grow in water and very wet spots. Um, again, you can just use one male for several. In fact, I don't even have a male, but my neighbor across the street does. So we're theorizing, my neighbor and I, that that's what's fertilizing my plants. And you can see this is in my little back, my little front yard, the huge plant with all those red berries. And the birds didn't eat it, the berries for a long time. A couple of winters ago, I was really getting worried about it, which is kind of silly to worry about stuff like that, but I do. And then one winter day in February, there was snow and these nice robins came and were eating. You can see there's a couple. And then I went inside and took a picture. Can you see all those birds there? They're in the winterberry holly and here they're in my hydrangea bush waiting for their turn. So by the end of that day, all the berries were gone. I needn't have worried. So perhaps one of the best things you can do to help the birds is to rethink the idea of fall cleanup. And we talked about that briefly in the beginning about leaving the seed heads. But another thing is just to leave the leaves. We have an aesthetic in modern America of having everything, like having no leaves on our ground. And that's really bad for um, our, the creatures that live with us, for the birds. So as much as possible, leave your leaves, leave them in, try to rake them into your garden beds and under trees. Um, they are they provide food for birds. If you do that, you will see birds foraging the leaves all through the winter for insects. And just a little commercial break to say, if you have to um, take get rid of your leaves, please try to um, 
you know, rake them, save them for garden mulch, mulch, and please do not use leaf blowers and especially don't use gas powered ones because they're extremely noisy and polluting. All leaf blowers just blast away wildlife habitats. I have this great quote here from the German Ministry of the Environment saying that they're fatal to insects in the foliage. And for our purposes tonight, insects are bird food, right? Um, if you're interested in this issue, um, the town I live in, Montclair, just passed a full ban on leaf blowers. And I actually started this organization, Quiet Montclair, four years ago. Other people have done a lot of work on it. Um, and a great website was created by my colleague, Peter Holm, called quietmontclair.org. I think a good way to work on this issue um, is to work on a seasonal ban to, um, to prohibit leaf blowers um, in the summer and the winter. So only allow them, for example, maybe for two months in the fall and one month in the spring. So um, just wanted to give a little commercial break for uh, trying to have better landscaping um, equipment and to do a more gentle way of fall cleanup. So here's some tips in general to care for our native habitats. A lot of these things I've mentioned as we, I've been discussing to plant the right place, of course, um, I've given this, the conditions to water well. After that, a lot of our natives are very drought resistant. Leave the leaves, leave perennial standing for stems, for seeds for our birds. Um, reduce invasive plants, and of course, don't use pesticides. They poison insects and they poison the birds. And maybe the best thing to think is, remember, the lazy gardener helps the bird get the worms and the insects. So the nice thing about native gardening is you can do less. It's better. Um, so where do you buy these plants? Um, I also here I have the cultivar issue to be a savvy shopper, watch out for cultivars, take the scientific names with you. Um, and I've listed some places that are that specialize in natives in this area. Um, some of them are mail order and I'm in, in New Jersey, sorry, not just in this area in New Jersey. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our garden centers still are not carrying natives. They do carry some of the things I've mentioned. Um, like golden rods and New England asters and some of the bushes, but it's nice to know about these um, sources also. Um, I know that you are members of Wild Ones, but I often say to people to consider Native Plant Society too. This is in all my talks, so that's just our website if you're interested. And I want to highlight that our chapter is actually having a shrub sale this Saturday when you're also having a field work day. So I don't want to dissuade you from going to do the work in the garden. Um, I'm actually doing a lecture that morning that's exactly the same as this lecture. It's the creating a bird friendly yard at 10 o'clock and then 11 to 1 we're selling shrubs because it is hard to find the native shrubs and I've listed we're selling arrowwood, we're selling blueberries, elderberries, sweet spires. Um, pepper bush, which is this, oh, a sweet spire is something I didn't have in here, pepper bush and winterberry. So um, just wanted to let you know about that. These shrubs are from Geno's, which is in Pennsylvania, far away, and the prices are incredible. They're 25 to $35 for two or three gallon shrubs. So just wanted to let, to highlight that. Um, and then also the Native Plant Society does great webinars on the third Wednesday of every month. So the next one is October 18th. I've listed it right here, and we'll be doing our fall virtual conference um, on Saturday, November 4th. Those are always great. This is a bush I didn't include because I had to make hard choices, but I thought I would give it a little bit of a shout out at the end. New Jersey tea bush um, is called that because our colonists used the leaves for tea during the um, British boycott um, and or our boycott of British tea. And it is a great bush. It is hard to find. Um, that's one reason I didn't highlight it. Um, but if you can find it, it likes to be grown in sun, part shade, well-drained soil. It does not like wet and it does not like being moved. Once you put it in, you'll just leave it there. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Um, I always like to say plant native, be a biodiversity ambassador and help preserve bird song for future generations. These are the hands of the grandchildren of my colleague, Dina Corbin. Um, so the more we can all work with um, kids, I think it's really um, helping the next generation. So thanks again for your attention and look forward to chatting with you.
Amazing. Thank you so much uh, for that beautiful, beautiful webinar. I loved hearing about all of the options for our um, native birds and just generally for our, you know, native species that live in our communities. So it's it's really refreshing. Um, we had some really great questions throughout the presentation. And so um, we can either start by talking about um, some people had questions about insects, like particular insects. We also have some questions about just invasive native plants in general. What what most interests you first? Well, why don't we start with invasive plant? Because that's not something I talked about. So I think that's yeah. good. Um, so absolutely. So um, we had a question. Um, first of all, all the recommendations throughout the presentation was that just focusing on New Jersey, or is that generally for Pennsylvania or other regions like in the tri-state area, upstate New York, or in any other locations? I try to include in my talks things that are native to New Jersey. Um, that is my parameters. But um, the, um, I just saw a, a question. I should, I'll just pay attention, not, not look at the question. Um, I tr I, so actually purple cone flowers, believe it or not, are not native to New Jersey, but everyone plants them anyway. And we act like they are so, but they're not actually native to New Jersey, but they're native to states around us. Most of the things that are native to New Jersey are also native to those other states you mentioned. So um, the answer is um, yes, that's where they are. So they're so. And the other thing, I guess, I like to say that I didn't say in the beginning of this lecture. I never know what the knowledge base is, so maybe I should always say it. But there's, I think of three things. There's native on the one hand of the spectrum, which is the best, and on mm -hmm. the other end, the worst is invasives. Invasives are plants from other country that are so good at reproducing that they're outcompeting our natives in wild areas. Then in the middle are ornamental plants, which don't help and don't hurt. Um, they're not invasive, but they're not helping because they're from other countries. So most of our insects do not use them. And you can even just observe that. They don't normally have the same amount of pollinator visiting them. Some of them do. Um, but so examples of that would be everything from daffodils to lilacs to tulips to zinnias and marigolds. And I want to say zinnias are, in a, they're in a, um, a flower that actually you do see a lot of pollinators and butterflies going to for the nectar. So they're not a host nice. plant, but I fear, I hypothesize, and I don't know if there's any truth to this, they're native to um, Mexico. Oh. And so it's not so far away from us. And so maybe that's why, I don't know. Yeah, but a lot of our plants- On their migrating path, like recognize that. Right. Um, but a lot of the plants we use are originally from Europe or even Asia. Um, and, you know, they're just not things like, and you can tell some of them because they have the word, a different country in the name, Japanese maple, Norway maple, mm -hmm. you know, that's an English ivy. I used to think Queen Anne's lace was native because it's what's called naturalized. It's a native, it's a non-native that has been so common that we think it's native. But then, as someone pointed out to me, we've never had a queen. So oh. Queen Anne's Lace is actually not native to the United States. It's native to England or other Europe. But it's they been know the here for so long from colonizing. That is very, right. really interesting. You know, you were mentioning a lot of our plants are from Asia and China. And there was actually a question about, um, is there a native bird that is like most supported for spotted lanternflies or any other invasive species? Is there a native bird that is most support that wants to eat lanternfly? Actually, um, I was just at this training this weekend, um, and someone said that they're finding the birds do not like the spotted lanternfly. They're not eating them at all. And of course, the host plant, well, maybe I shouldn't say of course, but in, in keeping with this theory, the host plants for the spotted lanternfly are plants from other countries, the tree of heaven. Again, and it's an invasive plant here. And then also, are, unfortunately, for um, agriculture, some of like the grapevines, which are not native either. So, yeah. So some like people are planting native trees. These things, these vines. It's yeah. It's some... interesting that you know the birds obviously are not familiar, and because they're bright red, they don't want to eat them. Um, yeah, that is super curious. I spit them out is what I've heard. Mm -hmm, so. Exactly. 
Um, just so everyone is aware, um, you can continue asking questions in the chat and we will continue to get to them. Um, we're gonna keep talking for about 20 minutes, just so everyone's aware. Um, so some people had questions about um, the grasses. Do they, the blue stem and the switchgrass, do they become aggressive in small areas? I have to say, I normally grow things, I normally talk only about things that I have grown myself and I have not grown the grasses um, just because I don't have that much room. And for the blue little blue stem, I actually tried to grow it and it was too wet. So again, I'm speaking from my experience there, right? It wasn't dry enough. Um, I think some of the, I would check that. I think that the um, switchgrass might be a little bit aggressive. I don't think the blue stem is. That's my um, general knowledge. The other thing I wanted to mention, and it wasn't in my slides, but here's a good thing. Um, for people to look at, I think the I think the best database base of plants for New Jersey is Jersey Friendly Yards, which is at jerseyyards.org. And they have a fantastic, and Haley, you're a great multitasker, you just put it in there. They have a great database, So and they will talk about that. They'll talk about how aggressive a plant is. So um, if, I think it's, I would say, before you go buy any plant, go look at Jersey Yards and check that out. Because yeah, you know what, very few beautiful. people, right, any any even nursery website, even if they're a, a native nursery and they're really good, they don't always say if it's aggressive, mm -hmm. <laughs> but Jersey Yards will be honest. Yeah, I mean, you can categories actually I can I could pull it up but basically they have categories of what area of New Jersey you're in if you want to just yeah. look for natives if you want to look for ferns for flowers for trees for bushes and you get an actual understanding of what the scientific name is so that when you go to your uh, local um, nurseries you are able to find the right products that actually will support your community. Um, we have yeah. asked some questions about specific uh, native plants. So a uh, quick question is, is the beautyberry bush a native plant? Are you familiar? I'm not very familiar with it is, but I do think it's native. Yeah, I had to make choices. I even, I wanted to put elderberry in because we're selling it this weekend, um, oh, nice. but I didn't, I didn't put that in, but that's another great one for the birds. They must really like it because I've only grown it for two years. And this year there was a good amount of berries on it. And I went away for 10 days and they were all gone. They were all gone. I, was I went to um the Brooklyn uh, Gardens um in, no, not the, the Brooklyn Gardens, but Battery Park Garden at the bottom of New York City. And they have an elderberry tree where you can actually eat from. And it was delicious. So right. I, I, I wanted to eat exactly some myself. I made one gin and tonic with a few elderberries and then went away to the beach for 10 days and came back and the birds had beat me to it. No more elderberry gin and tonic. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, and a question about a, a berry that you actually can't eat. Uh, the poke berries, are they a good food source for like which native bird would you say best? Like if you're trying to attract, if you have po poke berries. I think it's really, I think they're a good food source. Um, I don't know. I think in general, although I listed the berries that some birds like and what I've like observed robins and catbirds and the choke berries, I think it's hard to say a bird is only going to like a certain kind of berry. Mm. I think, you know, you can say that the hummingbirds are going to like the nectar, but otherwise I think it's, I would, I would just generally plant berries for any, for any bird. You know, I think it's harder to say, oh, this is going to attract this bird. That makes sense. Um, and then a question about the NJT bush. Do you can you tell us a little bit more about that plant? Yes, I can. I tried to say the main things. It doesn't have berries. It's a really good um, insect bush. It and so they say it's good for hummingbirds because they it will attract a lot of little insects. It's just full of insects when it blooms. Um, so I was focusing on berry bushes. So that's another reason I didn't include it, but it's a great, um, as you, the picture I had showed all the blossoms and, you know, I think the main thing is it needs to, it would need at least part sun and it needs to be not moved and it needs to be in well-drained soil. So I Got tend it. to be indecisive and I move my bushes around <laughs> and that is not what you can do with New Jersey tea bush. It wants it's to establish. Planted. It does it do well in like a large pot or it just wants to be in the ground. I don't know that it would grow in a pot. I think it's a yeah. little fussy. Um, and I think it's a little hard to find. Um, I think that 
I don't know for sure that any of those places I've listed sell it. I think you can find it at a mail order place in Wisconsin called Prairie Nursery. Oh yeah, I've heard of them. That's awesome. I Oh, and someone is saying she's growing five from seeds, Gisela. Well, that is great, Gisela. I would like to try that myself. I would love to hear how that works. Um, and Prairie Nursery is from Wisconsin and Wildwoods, uh, Wild Ones was started in Wisconsin too, right? Yeah, then somebody you know was that, actually it was. just talking about how um, they ordered from Wild Ones, but the raccoons, they got them. They got them out of the ground, uh, the stem grass, blue stem grass and the milkweed. That's pretty funny. Well, I guess the raccoons had some other motives. Um, so I actually had another question. Um, this person asked, are hostas good for the winter or should they be cut back before um, they're not? Hostas? Hostas. So hostas are not native. Of course. Um, they're also not invasive. So they're mm -hmm. one of those plants that is does neither good nor harm. I think they're thinking that they might provide cover. They could provide, so they don't, they're not really a food source, I don't think. I don't think that they're gonna, they're, they're spent, stems or flowers are going to be seeds for birds i've never seen that um but in general you don't need to cut back anything i mean just think i always like to think of the forest and the woods and the fields as my teacher so like in the forest no one's cutting back anything right and That's it's so all true. just yeah there's no one's asking the flowers are not asking for us to cut them back as I read recently, it's really, it's really true and that they will just decompose over time. So it's, I think it's up to you with the hostas. I don't think it would provide much benefit um, to leave them, but it doesn't hurt either. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the person. Oh, someone is just saying in the chat that her yeah. blooming hostas had lots of hummingbirds. Okay. Well, that's I great. Actually, I'm familiar with that as well, actually once. That's great. I did not I'm know curious. that. Yeah. I don't know why they're attracted Wonderful. to it, but yeah. Um, right. And anything else about hummingbirds that you can uh, recommend for yards or any other um, recommendations about hummingbirds? Yes, I did. That's the question I saw that Pamela had asked um, what, what flowers are good for hummingbirds. And I was just a little puzzled because I did mention it. Mm -hmm. They do like the red tubular flowers the best, but they like anything that's tubular is the way I, so I think like blue lobelia, um they like penstemon that's also tubular i guess i haven't examined hosta flowers but they must be somewhat tubular then so um you. Yeah, you know that's... anything any another thing would be trumpet vine which is orange tube tubular so anything that's tubular basically and brightly colored they prefer although i think hostas aren't so brightly colored and they like them and i think they like the white penstemon too so Amazing. Well, thank you for the for the advice on that. That's really appreciated. Um, we had a question actually about a butterfly. So um, are you able to tell me about the uh, host plant for the black swallowtail butterfly, our native butterfly? Our state butterfly. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's several. So that's one butterfly that has several host plants. It doesn't just have one like the monarchs. Um, and uh, the par parsley is actually a host plant for it, as well as dill. So two things that are in our gardens for to eat are, can be host plants. And sometimes people say their parsley gets decimated by the, the caterpillars of the swallowtail, but then they're happy that the swallowtails found it. Um, and then for a native plant, um, the uh, I'm having a brain freeze for a second here. Um, someone else is saying that uh, answering a different question. Um, I'm sorry, it'll come to me. There's a spring blooming plant, um, that is golden Alexander. So, oh, oh, thank nice. you, thank you, Anne. Thank Yay. you. That's a scientific name, Zizia aurea. Golden Alexander is a host plant, too. Oh, the trumpet vine was pretty invasive in the yard. Interesting. Well, and it went so larger than, well, I guess it's not invasive. It just like was aggressive, I guess, necessarily, right? Exactly. Thank you for that. I think we should be careful with our terminology. And I think if we have a native plant that grows quickly, um, then we should call it um, aggressive. aggressive. 
Yeah. Um, because it's not necessarily bad. It's native plants that if they're in the right place that are aggressive might be really useful about combating invasives. Saying you're doing a public gardening project and you have to take out mugwort, you need to replace it with something. You need to replace it with an aggressive native often, mm -hmm. or it will just all come back, right? So aggressive natives have their place, maybe not in a small urban garden like mine, but they certainly have their place. Where invasives is a term used for a plant that is not from this country that is not doing anything that's that's taking over natives so aggressive natives exactly. can be extremely helpful in mm -hmm. the right place yeah and I exactly. saw that like in the right environment not in a small yard baby that's yeah that's probably what it was um and I saw that Gisela put in the yeah. um, chat about this um the spice bush being a host plant also for the spice bush black swallowtail mm -hmm. that's a specific black swallowtail so beautiful Um, I actually wanted to share, um, if you don't mind, uh, the plant database on. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, this is actually what it looks like. I just wanted to show everyone. I think it's super helpful. So you can actually look for specific plants if you have something in mind. Um, but we are, I personally am in the Piedmont region of Hudson County over on this area. And then you can specifically filter by native plants only. It's really important to you know make that. And then obviously the deer resistance, depending on your area, um, attracts wildlife, et cetera. Yeah, bloom time and color. It's really cute. It's a very helpful database and I definitely- It's a very it. helpful database. I go to it all the time. I go to it all the time. So, and Gisela just put in this chat, um, another example of a plant that's, aggressive but helpful for the pollinators which is um some white snake root and that's blooming right now it's not necessarily a great bird plant but it's a great plant for pollinators it's so aggressive that you don't even have to plant it it just appears i have it all over my yard um and see gisela said it's killing my stilt grass so there's a great use of it it is a native plant um and so it's better to have that than stilt grass which is japanese stilt grass so yeah um, I actually had a question about um, the herbs. Are there any like, you know, multi-purpose plants that you would recommend to attract um, bird or caterpillars, birds, et cetera? That are herbs, mm -hmm. not native plants. So most, the herbs are not native. It's funny you ask that because I did another, I actually, this is my second um, second lecture I've done today. I did an in-person lecture on herbs in Melbourne. Um, it's the only non-native lecture I do. Well, the best herbs for are the ones I mentioned, parsley and dill, because they're a host plant for swallowtails. Oh, great. Um, other, so those are host plants, but most herbs are for our human consumption and are great for that, but they're not necessarily as I, I'm just trying to think through them. Yeah, they're besides not like mint, they're not really invasive. They're, or they're well, edible. <laughs> I mean, all those, what I generally say, what I said to people today, cause I did talk about natives for a few minutes is that most of the food we eat are not native plants, mm -hmm. but they're certainly not invasive. They're, yeah. we're glad yeah. we, and well, like, there, a lot of them are- like grows really, far and wide but you can like right. I mean take care of it really it's not like spoiled. yeah I mean so all of our food is yeah the, the food we eat corn and tomatoes peppers all that are not native to our country but um in, including the herbs but herbs are not going to do anything harmful they're not harmful like mint is aggressive but I wouldn't call it invasive when I gave my herb oh, talk today I suggested people plant it in a pot because it can take over that makes but sense. it's, you know, it's better than Japanese still grass and it's edible. <laughs> and it has, a, I, I, I love herbs. I have an herb talk because I feel that if people want to grow some food, herbs are the easiest thing to grow and the most rewarding. That's amazing. That's I love that. Thank you for sharing. That's great. Sure. And they, and they generally don't get eaten by animals because they have the, the strong aromas. Nice. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, does anybody have any other questions um, that they wanted to share before we move on to closing statements? Um, thank you so much, Deb, for the wonderful webinar. It was really great to learn all about the birds and the options that we have to support our ecosystems.
Great. Well, thank you for hosting and for doing the question, the Q&A. I really appreciate it. And thank you for inviting me and for everyone who attended. Hope you come back, Deb. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, Mary's going to leave the leaves. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> All right. That was wonderful. Did you have a lot of orders for your uh, shrubs, Deb? We do. We got a lot of pre-orders. We have 94 pre-orders. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. That was good. I, I was gonna try to make it to get place an order and it's been crazy. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm taking a soil class on top of everything else I'm doing which I am totally enjoying it, but it's two days a week and a lot of work, um, <laughs> but totally, yeah, yes. The uh, so workshop funny. you were at, was it, the workshop that you attended this uh, weekend, was it uh, Women in Their Woods? It wasn't, but that might've been a better one to be at. I was at one called yeah. Women's Stewards. Oh, okay. Yes, Did I was you... there uh, three years ago and a friend of mine was, two of my friends were there and they didn't at know the, each other. At the Women in the Woods? Yes. Yeah. That they was said the it was weekend. very, very good. Yeah. Yes. And my um, friend, Sarah, um, Sarah Webb, who was, who created the Drew Forest, spoke at the Women in the Woods one. Yeah. Yes. Great. Yes, I, I was going to hope, you know, I, I went once and I should have gone back. But thank you. Thank you again. And thank you, everyone that, you know, has stayed with us till the end. Uh, thank you. And thank you for your questions and keep doing what you're doing, planting those natives and learning how can we best, uh, you know, take care of our wildlife and our, uh, and our, and our land. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, yeah, Deb. I really, really appreciate your um, your time in this. Um, we were getting some questions um, as well. I would love to answer real quick that we do have a YouTube um, that we will be posting the webinar on. So straight from what you're watching right now so that you're able to do that. Um, but if we need a PDF, I don't know, Deb, question, are you able to send it if you'd like? I mean, yes, I would. I'll be glad to send you a PDF. That's amazing. Great. Um, I'm I'll do it right after we um, sign off. So I send it to both of you? Yeah, Haley, I don't know if I have your email, so I'll send it to, yeah. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pass welcome. it on to Gisela to do the closing statements. Thank you so much for your evenings. Thank you for all being here. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, uh, you know, support us. Uh, it, um, the Essex County uh, Native Plant Society or Wild Ones, do what you have to do, support your native um, organizations because we are doing this not only for us, for future generations as well. So um, thank you and continue your support. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Take care. Good night, everyone. Sure. Good night. Um, did we want to mention about the um, volunteer session anymore? We feel good. Yeah. Definitely. If anyone's still, you know, available to come out this Saturday, come out and give us a hand. Uh, we're doing our demonstration for Sorry, Haley. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I was saying you can go to one and then go to the other. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yes. I'm just. No, um, definitely. Yeah. We, we talked about that before. Yes. Um, go, come and give us a hand and then run and get your shrubs or pick up your shrubs and uh, come over exactly. to Allison Park in Englewood Cliffs. Um, do and, what uh, you can. 
Yeah, thank you. And if you would like to join our team um, and volunteer with us, you're totally welcome to apply for any of the positions for the board, but as well as just other volunteer, you know, positions to help the organization um, grow and yeah, feel like a like a community. So yeah, if you'd like to volunteer with us, we would love your support. Um, and we also have a Facebook and an Instagram to keep updated on our upcoming events and what we have going on. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. And yeah, we hope to see you at upcoming events. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night.